No matter what's causing your lateral or outer knee pain, it is treatable. So in this video, we'll discuss why lateral knee pain happens in climbers, how to diagnose your specific issues, and what you can do on your own to fix it. So let's go. <sighs> Lateral knee pain from climbing related activities is common due to the high stress we impose on our legs while heel hooking, high stepping, hiking, and of course, falling. These activities can result in traumatic or overuse related injuries to one or more of the following tissues. The biceps femoris, the iliotibial band or IT band, the lateral meniscus, or the lateral collateral ligament or LCL. The biceps femoris is one of our hamstring muscles. The tendon for this muscle attaches on the back lateral side of our knees. That tendon can get damaged if loaded with excessive force, which can easily happen during a heel hook. This maneuver often places rotary forces on the knee as well, which can exacerbate the strain on the biceps femoris and other hamstring muscles. The IT band is a dense piece of connective tissue that runs alongside the outside of our knees. It typically causes lateral knee pain due to contact with the lateral condyle of the femur. While heel hooking, the IT band is fully tightened and can press up against that condyle. If there is subsequent overload of force in that position, like when your foot slips or you miss a hold, the IT band can get sprained. Alternatively, IT band issues happen from hiking due to suboptimal biomechanics of the lower extremity or poor form while walking. Lack of glute muscle engagement and frequent knee valgus, aka like the knee moving inward, increases rubbing of the IT band on the femur, resulting in irritation. The lateral meniscus is a disc-shaped chunk of fibrocartilage that acts like a shock absorber in the knee. It can tear as a result of trauma to the joint and is particularly vulnerable during twisting or rotating of the knee as well as when the knee is fully bent. Gnarly heel hooks, off-balance high steps, and uneven hiking terrain can expose the meniscus to these types of forces. Finally, the LCL is the ligament on the outer side of our knees. It can be sprained or torn from traumatic force to the knee, however, it is less likely to be injured during climbing-related activities than the other three tissues. This is because climbing usually does not create enough varus force on the knee or bowing out of the knee to cause injury to the LCL. While it is possible with some more gnarly heel hook positions to add that varus force, it usually would create more strain and stress to the other aforementioned structures before it would cause an injury to the LCL. So if a climber does suffer an LCL injury, it would most likely be due to a traumatic fall. Now here's a cool little chart to help you visualize all this information and narrow down what's causing your lateral knee pain. We can, however, increase our certainty quite a bit with a few simple tests, which we might as well do right now. These are the tests that you can do yourself relatively easily without the help of a professional. However, you should always use caution and stop if you're uncertain or feel more than mild pain. As a quick note, you'll notice I mentioned the joint line a few times in this section. The joint line is the outer portion of the knee that you can actually see and touch. The joint itself is the articulating surface between the femur and tibia, which you cannot dig into and reach, but you can indeed inspect the external surface of the joint, aka the joint line. Test 1. Resisted knee flexion. Start sitting on the ground with your knee bent at 90 degrees, with the heel on the ground and the toes in the air. Slowly increase the force on your heel, pressing it into the ground. Note the location of any pain this causes. If you had no pain, repeat this test with the knee slightly straighter at about 70 degrees and slightly more bent at about 120 degrees. Test number two, palpation to specific locations. While I don't think palpation should be your gold standard for diagnosis in this case, it can still be helpful if we pay close attention to specific locations. Be sure to note your pain levels while doing this. Starting with gentle pressure and slowly building up, palpate directly at the joint line. Now palpate below or distal to the joint line and just behind or posterior to the joint line. Move back to the original position and then palpate above or proximal to the joint line. Keep in mind, significant pain can be diffuse, making this test less accurate. If you have that much pain, you should reassess at a later date or better yet, see a doctor. Test number three, varus test. Normally the varus test is reserved for skilled practitioners, but you can do a modified version on your own. Sit on the ground with your injured leg straight close to the wall. The outside of your foot should be able to touch the wall, but your hip should not. Gently press the outside of your foot against the wall, stopping if you feel pain or laxity in your lateral knee. If you don't feel pain, bend your knee to about 30 degrees and repeat this test. Meniscus test cluster. The meniscus test cluster is a group of five tests that can effectively determine how likely you are to have a meniscus injury. 
One of the tests absolutely requires a skilled practitioner to administer, and another one, it certainly helps to have someone with experience to accurately palpate the structure, but we're gonna go through these four tests because they can still help accurately identify your issue. Test one, catching or locking of the knee. If you have a history of catching and or locking, you are positive for this test. Test number two, lateral or medial joint line pain. This is the one where it helps to have someone with experience to accurately identify the joint line, but if you feel confident and you do have pain with palpation directly over the joint line, you are positive for this test. Test number three, pain with forced hyperextension or straightening of the knee. If you cannot straighten your leg passively without pain, you are positive for this test. If you are able to fully extend your leg without pain, place one or both hands on top of your thigh close to the knee. Gently push down, attempting to straighten your knee out further. You may need to place a small towel under the heel to help elevate your thigh off the ground to accurately perform this test. If this causes you pain, you are positive for this test, but make sure to note the location of pain. Test number four, pain with maximal passive knee flexion or bending of the knee. Start by simply trying to bend your knee in, using your hand to assist to make it a passive test. If you have pain stopping you before you can bend your knee as far as your uninjured leg, you're positive for this test. If you're positive for three or four of these self-administered meniscus tests, you very likely have a meniscus injury and should seek help from a professional. If you test positive for just one or two of these tests, you may still have a meniscus injury, but the chances are lower. If you are negative to all three tests, there are still other tests that can help diagnose a meniscus injury, but they are more complicated and should be performed with guidance of a skilled professional. Now that you've completed these tests, you should be able to narrow down what is most likely causing your lateral knee pain by comparing your results to this chart. Of course, self-diagnosis is not always easy or accurate, but this should get you on the right track. The treatment for lateral knee pain will of course depend on what your specific issue is, though there is often some overlap. Meniscus rehab will involve range of motion activities with a Swiss ball, side steps with a resistance band, and eventually double leg and then single leg squats on an unstable surface to improve stability of the lower extremity. Biceps femoris rehab will involve gentle standing hamstring stretches with leg rotation, heel bridges for initial strengthening, then progressive hamstring strengthening such as Nordic hamstring curls, single leg RDLs, and a gradual return to heel hooking on the wall. IT band rehab will involve side steps with a resistance band at your toes and or side planks, progressing to side planks with a hip dip and or leg lifts. Foam rolling to the IT band may also be useful in some cases. Finally, LCL rehab will involve range of motion activities with a Swiss ball, side steps with resistance band progressions starting at your thighs and working down to the ankles and finally feet, squats with band at the thighs, and eventually three-way single leg squats. As a general rule with all these rehab activities, you should not really feel pain with them. But if you do, there should be no more than about a two out of 10 pain, and the pain should not linger afterwards. For strengthening exercises, I generally aim for two to three sets of eight to 12 repetitions, focusing on keeping the repetitions slow and controlled. For stretching, I prefer two to three reps of 30 to 45 second holds. For the range of motion work, perform higher reps like eight to 10 with five second holds at each position. Since we're clearly obsessed with organization on this channel, here's one last chart to get your rehab on track. Most lateral knee injuries can be solved in about eight to 12 weeks, depending on severity, of course. If you're not making any progress with your injury in eight to 12 weeks though, be sure to reach out to a skilled professional for more guidance. The great thing about these exercises and knee rehab in general is after you've rehabbed your injury, the same exercises can be used to help prevent a future injury. Final food for thought, if you're feeling down about your knee pain, remember that it is a highly treatable condition. If you liked this video, hit that like button and let us know what other rehab related videos we should make. Until next time, train, climb, send, repeat.